It can be really hard to come up with unique and interesting ideas for every single D&D campaign that you want to put together. That's why I created a series on my channel where I give you daily input about plot hooks or stories or just little things to think about to help inspire you for your next campaign. However, those shorts I feel are very, very quick and therefore don't really give you the ideas and the time to process it. So I've decided to bring together all of my videos from 101 to 200 for you to kind of see in one video together. I did this for my first 100, so you can go check out that video if you want. But unlike that one, I'm not going to just read out what I did in those videos. Instead, we are going to actually just go through them and give you a bit of background about them and give you ideas to think about. I'm hoping that this is something that you can put on in the background when you next uh, do some D&D planning or when you're cooking dinner or on the bus or whatever. If you do find anything in here helpful or it inspires your next campaign, please do drop a like. Massively helps the channel, but do not feel any obligation to do so. I just hope you enjoy. So, number 101 was all about wargs and talked about the mounts that different um, species in your world may ride. For example, I came up with Goliaths riding elephants and adventurers who obviously ride horses. There's this kind of vibe that if you have a certain animal that a different species will look after or to um, rear as their kind of livestock, then you can get a bit of a more world building kind of idea just from seeing a new species. Number 102 was about orcs, and it was all about the religion that they have, about um, the great orcish god Grumsh, who was slighted by the other gods. Now, this is a real thing from the Forbidden World, um, Forbidden Realms wiki, sorry. And it's the idea that he was the last to pick when it came to choosing areas for his races, and so everyone else laughed at him, and that's why orcs are so um, annoyed at every other species in the entire game. Number three was all about Aracocras, about how if they grapple somebody and fly up, then they can drop. Now, this was met with quite a few comments saying how if you attack the Aracocra, they will have to fall and drop and all of this sort of stuff. But it's an idea to think about if you have some kind of flying enemy that can pick up and drop enemies, then that could be an interesting um, thing for your party to fight, especially given that they will want to be able to try and take them out but then taking them out could drop a friend and make them take a lot of damage from falling from a height number four went back to kind of mounts and things but in this side i was actually looking at awakened animals now think about how would awakened animals be treated in your world would they be given the same rights as other people especially given that they are now as intelligent as other creatures it's one of those things that is a bit of a morally grey area. It's not something we've had to deal with in the real world, but it's an interesting idea for something for one of your campaigns to be centred around. 105 was all about crawling crawls, the idea that these hands of murderers are getting reanimated and taking over an entire city. These things clambering around everywhere, and the players wake up to find an entire city covered in zombie hands, pretty much. Always nice to have something that your players wake up to and suddenly, whatever they were doing beforehand, that's going to have to wait, because there's a bigger problem now. Number 106 was all about bone devils. So this was talking about uh, devil hierarchies. I've done an entire, um, what's it called, guide on devils. So do check that out if you're interested in a bit more of that. But in this one, I was talking about the fact that um, different devils have to respect uh, to earn respect from other levels in the hierarchy. And therefore, you could definitely have a uh, bone devil kind of trying to get a lower devil to do something against your party and there the lower devil is trying really hard to try and impress them so that they can then get promoted and moved up the hierarchy so it's very interesting to have a secondary bad who's doing it for their own benefit and doesn't really have a problem with the party but it gives you an additional idea for multiple different bads some that are badder than others well number 107 was all about harpies about luring your players into different areas um, how they are going to have different motivations than a lot of enemies because a lot of enemies are, as I've said before, in hierarchies, whereas harpies are very individualistic and um, they can turn very, very dangerous if they are become malicious. So the one example I had here was if there was a harpy that wanted to take an entire city for ransom, they could by making them all march towards a volcano. This is a interesting kind of time-based sensitive idea but by all means, change it up for your campaign. Number 108 was all about how um, <laughs> Minecraft Steve is a monster, if you think about it, in the case that if you would have a D&D &D campaign where 
um, a benevolent sorcerer was setting up enchantments that created an iron golem to protect a village every single time that there were um, enemies coming near. Then there was some kind of evil, um, probably more likely to be some kind of devil or demon that has set up a base nearby and uses that um, enchantment to then gain iron for their own use. That would be some kind of very evil being that is just completely destroying these golems as they're being produced by trapping these villagers. That could be a very interesting uh, antagonist for a future campaign. The next one, 109, was all about an overzealous general demanding his troops continue fighting. Now, this is a bit of an interesting one because it is actually based on a story from one of my campaigns where I put this in front of a party and they decided to convince the general that there was a ghost of Christmas past, no, a ghost of war past, a ghost of war present and a ghost of war future coming. And it did eventually convince him to change his ways as it was very, very effective. But yeah, it's a cool idea just to make it so you have to try and convince a guy who is so steadfast in his ways to change his plan. Next one was up to, uh, was about Kuatoa, these like um, almost fish eating other fish. It's a bit much. But I've always liked the idea of one of these things that has become such a glutton that it completely wipes out the food source for a fishing village. And it becomes, when the party go to fight it, it's huge. It's like this almost elephant-sized thing that's rolling around, smacking them around. It's kind of an interesting idea to change up what you know about a species and just to exaggerate something. The next one was a very simple kind of double agent idea, 1111 which was um, a the orc armies are attacking a city, but they somehow managed to get in very, very quickly and very, very easily. Why was that the case? Well, that could be what your party are trying to investigate. Is it a knight that uh, betrayed the king? Did some they get an infiltration from a different way? It's up to you to come up, come up with that idea, but I thought this was a good idea for a little arc insider campaign. Uh, up next, we decided to go full Moby Dick and have the killer whale as 112. This is kind of allowing you to have a pirate adventure where you have got your party on a pirate ship, plundering the seven seas and doing all of this, and then a huge killer whale just comes and attacks the ship. And it's how your party deal with that. Maybe they get shipwrecked, maybe they have to um, f build another ship to fight back and then take down this whale. But yeah, that's kind of an idea based on a very old literary classic. Um, next one was a very, very simple, very, very sweet idea about jackals who are known for being very, very affectionate to one other partner, similar to swans. They become co-parents and all this sort of stuff. So having uh, two of these dogs kind of fall in love and have your party have to help that them find each other, maybe with a speak to animals kind of vibe or something like that. That could be a really cool um, dynamic for one of your plot arcs. Now, 114 looked into invisible stalkers. Now, I had never heard of these before I wrote this one, but they are great in my opinion. They can be used as minions for BBGs and you have no idea that they are there, especially if you make them more happy-go-lucky uh, villains. Maybe not villains the wrong word, but maybe happy-go-lucky instead of being particularly evil. And um, eventually, once you discover it and they've realized the chaos that it's caused, maybe then a really big fight ensues. Moving on to 115, uh, we talked about ice methods. Now, this was me thinking about what kind of world would there be if you needed to get to the, um, if you were stuck in a frozen wasteland. So I thought maybe the North Pole, a race to the North Pole um, plotline where you are against your party are up against another group of adventurers and there is some kind of reward for whoever gets to the North Pole first. I suppose in this world, it'd be like the center of the uh, plane, the prime material. So what makes this I this idea even more fun is if you give them an ice method that has to help them, but is just there to be annoying or just there to kind of throw different obstacles in their way, just to make it a bit more interesting rather than just a frozen wasteland with nothing there. Now, this next one, 116, is probably one of my favourites. It's all about hydras and how if they can either start with five heads which is what you mostly expect them to be, but there is absolutely no reason why these Hydras cannot start a fight with, say, 50 heads or 100 heads. Now, I know that if it had these 100 different attacks, then it would end your party immediately, but therefore what I thought would be a cool idea is if you took a step back and decided to, uh, say, you are aware of this Hydra, and because it has so many heads, you know that you can't go and attack it full on. So you have to come up with a way around it. The party have to decide, oh, maybe if we give it this potion or trick it or do something like that, maybe you'll be able to get a way around and 
actually get a good plot hook out of not a direct fight. Now, 117, we were looking into giants at this stage, and it was all about how some giants may not fit the mold. It's always fun to take a species in D&D, like an orc or a goblin or even a devil, and make it so that that particular devil is not actually like the rest of its kin. And that's what I was thinking here. So there is a hill giant who has found this magical herb that has made it incredibly smart, but unfortunately, um, this plant is very invasive and is poisonous to other beings. And therefore, you've got this hill giant who is struggling to be a member of society because his food source is absolutely poisonous to everybody else. And therefore, you have to kind of come up with how your party are going to deal with this. Maybe just have it that this invasive species is coming originally. And then they have to kind of work back and try and work out who's causing it and find this giant who is actually not at fault, really. Number 118 was about a gladiator arena where your party just get woken up inside an arena's dungeon and they have to then be pushed out to fight against other adventurers. Now this is a very simple start but it could be the start of a campaign where instead of meeting in a tavern you meet in this way and you're immediately forced to fight and you then have to work out a way of escaping this kind of elaborate game. 119 was about giant toads. Now this is an idea that you were to be searching for some kind of plant or some kind of mushroom and you go for it and you finally find it in a swamp after days of searching and once you go for it you grab it and it turns out that it actually only grows on the back of these giant toads who do not like it being taken from them. That's why it took so long to find because these things are jumping around all over the place and uh, your players are going to have to fight this thing in order to get it back. So number 20, we moved on to Dao. Now these are genies, and I really pretty much just talked about why would genies do what they do? Why are they so bitter, and why are they kind of... Why do they even grant wishes at all? So therefore, maybe I thought, maybe you need to make sure that your genies, if in your games, have got motives of their own, and therefore will only give out their wishes if the party do certain things for them. And in that way, you can kind of make it a bit more a transactional relationship. Next, we went on to Kua Toll, which are these um, dragon-like things. Like, if you've ever seen one of those dragons in the ampersand of the D&D, that's what this is. And they are normally protectors of villages or stuff like that. And so, therefore, I thought, why not have it that the party find one that is dying? These things live for a long time, but now it has to... Now the party are going to have to go and find a new guardian of the village, or maybe the um, other kuatol that will kind of get an is it kuatol kuatol who will then come with the other person and they will make a new guardian of the village maybe that's something that's needed to happen for centuries but just hasn't happened yet so now we move on to 122 which is all about cyclopses or cyclope i guess they normally live on their own but however if you have a plot hook where i don't know some kind of evil powerful being has promised them a lot of stuff if they help them then maybe you can bring them together and have a kind of cyclope army, which would be quite cool. After that, we moved on to 123, which is Air Elemental Myrmidon. Now, these are elementals that have been forced into suits of armor. They do create have their memories from before this, and that's where the idea of this kind of plot hook came from. If you introduce your party to an Air Elemental right at the start of any campaign, and then have it by about session 20 or something turn up as an evil suit of armor inhabited by something uh, and have it fight them and have it be a problem for them that they have to go up against and then later on reveal that it's actually their friend then overall it will be a very kind of quasi idea of messing with your players next we moved up to this um this the idea of different dragons being good and evil and with one two four we looked at young green dragons so now what happens if one of these um, dragons was actually Instead of hating all humans or elves or orcs or anything like that, what if they were rejected by their mother and therefore they hate all other dragons as well? And therefore you've got this kind of anti-hero almost who doesn't like any of the other races, but is actually pretty... There's a mutually beneficial arrangement with him getting revenge on his other kin who have rejected him, while also the other races who they are attacking benefit from those no longer being there. There's a kind of a weird dynamic there that could be quite interesting for a D&D &D campaign. 
After that, we looked at yetis for 125. Now, this is an idea of finding a yeti cub, something that is normally very intimidating, but as a baby, and then having the party have to either take it back to its um, its parents, or maybe raise it as their own, or working out how to even raise a yeti, because that's a bit of a, a an interesting conundrum in its own right. But this sort of thing where you've got a very different idea of how it all works could be an interesting idea. After that, we looked at Glabrazoo. Now, Glabrazoo are interesting creatures, and they come with kind of plot hooks for themselves. This is the idea that they can... Um, I don't know, they, they can manipulate people very, very easily. So therefore you could have some kind of evil BBEG that is just being manipulated by one of these things. Probably not a good idea to do this for your main BBEG, but for some of the others it may be a bit fun. After that, we looked on to Storm Giant Skeletons. Now, this is an idea that you can maybe build into a big necromancer arc where you've got a lot of like low-level minions, zombies, skeletons, all that sort of stuff. But then right at the end, you can have a Storm Giant ally that they had very early on in the campaign that has now been reanimated to attack them. Either that or just have something where all of the bones of the skeletons that you have defeated are scattered on the floor, they come together to form an even bigger thing that's fighting you. Something like that would really give you a bit more jeopardy in this sort of thing. So coming back to dragons for number 128, we have now looking at blue dragon wormlings. However, there is this was an idea I had which was where because a blue dragon had angered the god of time, they made it so that their child was never able to grow out of being a wormling. Therefore, it's not necessarily as strong as a full dragon, but they are actually very quick, very agile, and also they can use the youth to their advantage to maybe manipulate people. So therefore, you have a fully intelligent dragon that is stuck inside the body of a wormling, and maybe there's a thing about it wanting to appease the god of time or get revenge or something like that as a new cool plot hook. I then looked at these Oerion Reversers. Now, these are some of my favourite ones because they literally turn all healing magic into damage. And so that can be something to throw on your party at any stage. It's a trick, a trick that they'll learn very quickly. So it's therefore not too much of a dick move to give it to your party. But it is one of those that's a bit unique. And therefore your cleric suddenly becomes like, oh, now I need to actually fight and do other things. Extra points if you manage to make it so that they try to use attacking damage on their friends to see if it heals them. That would be an extra little um, thing to mess with your players. So now we move on to another kind of genie, a marriage. Now these are kind of water-based, based from the elemental plane of water, and apparently they love stories. And so I had this um, idea that this marriage was so powerful that while the party met them, then they tried to tell the party a story, the party interrupted. And as revenge, the Marid has made the players become characters in its story. And the only way for them to escape is to survive until the end of the story. The next one, 131, is all about kobolds and how most of the time they are seen as slaves to dragons, which is kind of the dynamic that has been set up in the books. But, however, what if you had a entire... Um, dragon's cavern that has actually been taken over by kobolds who unionized and took out the dragon that enslaved them. Instead of fighting a dragon at the end of this, you f if you are angering the kobolds, you fight a dragon carcass that has now got kobolds inhabiting it and using it to attack the players with its own weird attack attacks and defenses. Maybe it'd be something you have to create an entirely new stat block for. We then go back to looking at some kind of mount, which is the Nightmare. And this is talking mostly about the uh, BBEG and what sort of uh, uh, creatures it has around it. So a Nightmare is a great idea to give your BBEG as some kind of just to make them seem all out badass. And therefore, it's one of those more fun things to add. However, you could, on the other hand, have it so that they have got a horse just a normal horse that is the one weakness to them that they really love or something like that just to make them feel a little bit more human however if you want a purely evil one then a nightmare is the way to go next we moved on to twig blights now 133 was all about making your players feel powerful every so often it's good to throw at them something that is just kind of like overwhelmingly they are going to lose this fight but on the other hand it is good to give them a fight every so often that they just plow through and my favourite thing is to send a whole load of twig blights, or maybe cultists also work in this regard, 
but they make your players feel powerful because especially if you use cleaving rolls where they can do excess damage to others they can just cleanly swipe through five of these things in one hit and that just makes them feel great especially if you give them like hundreds of these things that are all charging trying to get at them but the players are just mow mowing through them before they can get attack in just nice to give your players a boost especially after they've like had a bad fight or something up next we have the rock gnome recluse now these guys like to build so they're like the artificers of the um of the monster manual although they do come from dragon of ice spear actually um but as what i did like the idea is about if you found one of these where they were making these wondrous inventions but none of them actually worked and then you come across a village that has been buying them from this trader which is a rock gnome recluse walking around and now the party have to deal with the destruction that has been made by these devices and a very large group of angry townsfolk who want to get revenge on this rock gnome as you'd expect um dungeons and dragons has a lot of dragons so yet another dragon story 135 this is all about how they like to disguise themselves as humans especially if it helps them to achieve what they want to do so maybe if you make one of these dragons a helpful npc um, therefore the player will come across it and be like, oh, this is someone who we want to spend some time with, but then they could very easily be a dragon instead. An idea I did come up with for this story was what if you found an NPC who was a dragon expert who wanted to help the party acquire a rare medicine to cure dragons from all kinds of diseases, and it turns out that that NPC itself is actually the dragon, and who is inflicted by this disease, and you can decide whether that's a good dragon or a bad dragon that they're now helping. We then move on to horizon back tortoises now these things are huge and i thought the idea of these things being hidden so for example six burial hills and people start to hear rumors of like treasures being buried beneath these hills so they go and attack them and find that these are actually giant turtles that are ready to fight back next we looked at shadow ghasts for 138 now this is all about a huge army, maybe towards the end of a campaign, the party are about to st uh, siege the big bad's castle. And they've got a huge army because they've managed to convince the king to help. But in return, the BBEG has sent shadow ghasts in to try and take out members of the army as it marches. And therefore, the players have to find this assassin as the, um, as the armies march, otherwise they will be decimated by the other army when they arrive. Then I moved on to number 139, which was all about tiny servants. Now, these guys are cool little items that have been given arms and legs by mag magicians so that they can fight back and do little things. I thought this was a cool idea was that they, the Artificer's Guild has been under attack and there is a novice artificer who only knows how to do this tiny servant thing, cannot do anything else, and therefore has animated everything in the basement to kind of come to life and help defend the uh, Artificers Guild. Unfortunately, in doing so, he found a secret passage which the enemies were using to actually get in. So now he is trying to defend it, while as he then sends a book, which he has written in to say, please come help me, and he sends one of these tiny servants out to try and meet your players. Number 140 is always fun. It is a doppelganger story. This idea was the idea that you can make one of your players be replaced by a doppelganger the best thing to do is to keep it secret or ask that player to leave the room and have them message answers to you as the dm then you can say to the party the two answers that they get so you they don't know whose is the best one for them to actually use number 141 was all about being about, about revenants now the idea about this is if you had a character a player who hate who loved a character that they were playing and then that character died you could bring them back as a revenant now this would give them some cool undead skills maybe you should give them some weaknesses such as a vulnerability to radiant damage or something but this would give them a cause to come back and uh, complete their mission at least so they at least feel fulfilled with their story now i do understand that death is part of dnd so it may be that you don't want to do this sort of thing but it's an idea and it could maybe be an idea for an npc that your players interact with I've done a lot of hobgoblin stories and 142 is yet another one. Um, in that vein, we are going to talk about this hobgoblin who has become a celebrity in a town. And it's a hobgoblin who actually isn't that nice a guy and turns out that he's just constantly in the right place at the right time to be looking like a hero, when in essence he wants to be the villain. He wants to look bad, but he just can't do it. Maybe it's some kind of curse, maybe it's just pure luck and your party have to work out what the best thing to do about this situation is. 
Then we looked at Sturges for 143. Now, this is the D&D equivalent of mosquitoes. These are tiny bat mosquito things, and they like to attach themselves to other creatures, sucking blood. And I just thought that these were quite interesting. Maybe you could have your party stumble across a hive of these things where you have to fight a queen and all of this sort of stuff to think about not just the exact monsters that you have available to you, but maybe turning them on their heads and making more powerful versions or weaker versions to try and make it feel like a bit more of a hierarchical system or a variety of enemies for your players to face. Moving on from a similar vibe, we also had the um, Hell Wasps from Baldur's Gate as the inspiration for 144. This is all about um, how they are kind of crazy. They have impacts on, on players, on NPCs to make them crazy. And the idea being is that they have, if a beekeeper managed to get some of this honey that these wasps are creating or at least infecting from beehives, then it, this honey would also have the same effect. And if the players investigate what's causing these craziness in some people, they'll track it back to the honey, then have to find the the honeybees, and it turns out that the honeybees have been kind of replaced or affected by hell wasps, which would be an interesting fight. The next one was 145, about black dragon wormlings. Now, the idea behind this is that they are amphibious, so why would they not have an underwater base? Often a lot of bases you find for dragon fights are just caves underneath mountains, but maybe you should go underwater and force your players to come up with ideas for how to survive those sorts of fights. Number 146 was all about husk zombies. Now, this is kind of the generic infection scenario. Husk zombies are if you attack, if a zombie bites you or attacks you, you then turn into a zombie yourself. This could lead to your players having to deal with a, a, a hospital having been taken over by these things. And they wake up and find that this entire hospital is now an incubus of zombies that is now needing to be dealt with but they have to be careful 147 was all about whether necromancy was actually 100 evil at all times maybe a member of your party needs to work out whether or not it is actually evil to bring back a big beholder in order to help them fight off an even bigger bad it's the lesser of two evils argument but it is a cool idea to maybe have a bit, bit like maybe that necromancer that we killed at the start wasn't so bad a guy after all uh, number 48, 148, I should say, were all about jackal wares, which are about looking into wear creatures in a bit more um, detail. And um, instead of jackal wares being bitten by another wear jackal, they are instead jackals that have been bitten by the curse of Grazd. Now, this is the thing that means they can hide a full on jackals, which means it's much easier for them to hide in a group. Now, remember earlier on I talked about a plot hook where you had two jackals that were in love? Maybe you come back to those shackles later on and one of them has been turned into a jackalware and now you have to deal with that situation. Number 149 was actually all about beholders and how you should actually send big enemies against your low level parties. But only if you have weakened the big bads and also if you are going to make it so that they don't actually end up having to kill the big bad. So this beholder could be able to fight these things, scare them and then be run away when they do something in particular. It could be a bit of luck, it could be that they found its one weakness, but it would be an interesting way for them to have a, an enemy that they really want to go after from day one. Number 150, now we're halfway there. This is all about cloakers now. I, I don't know, I can't think of cloakers without thinking about Doctor Strange's cape, how it suffocates and grabs hold of people, but that's what these things are. They grab onto like creatures and just don't let go, and if you attack them when they're on someone, that creature will also take a load of damage. I thought maybe you could have a creature like this attach itself to a very, very weak NBC, like a child, and therefore the party have to work out how to actually deal with that situation. So yeah, I hope that is something that you're interested in. So now that we're halfway through, I'm quickly just going to ask if you have found anything here particularly interesting, please do like and subscribe. But also, if you've had any ideas sparking from anything here, please do drop a comment with what that inspiration was, and I'll try and include it in a future video on this series. So now we are looking at future um, golem ideas for 151. Now the idea here is that well, obviously you have available stat blocks for stone, iron, clay, flesh golems. And Candlekeep Mysteries introduces us to Lightning Golems. But there is, because those 
show that anything could be a golem. You could introduce other ideas for your different golems in the future. So you could have water golems or plant golems or wood golems, all these sorts of things that you could be underwater and suddenly this thing forms into some kind of creature. Air golems, where suddenly this air becomes almost solid in its way. It's always quite fun to have this idea that um, anything you want can be an enemy, but maybe not quite a mimic, because a mimic is quite a run and done thing. Next one we were looking at was an, another underrated kind of monster from the monster manual, which is the Remoraz. Now, I thought about the idea of this being a young Remoraz, which is an arctic hunter which uh, with a body that radiates warmth. So I thought maybe if your party finds an injured one of these, then they can use it as, if they heal it back to health and then befriend it, they could use it as transport across a frozen tundra because it provides its own warmth. So maybe that's an idea for something that can give you some inspiration. Now we move on to 153, which was a keg robot. Now these things are fun. I thought you could add this to maybe an even early encounter in a tavern where your party end up brawling with someone else and then they try to maybe use one of these kegs to throw at someone else turns into a robot, turns out that this is this tavern's security system, that it's now trying to stop, put an end to this fight by subduing both parties. Suddenly there's three sides to this fight, suddenly it becomes chaos and the party have to decide whether they just cut their losses and run. Next we looked on to Ogrelons for 154. Now these are the child of an orc and an ogre. Now these guys have the worst of both worlds sometimes. And maybe you should have a story where the party are working with one and it's going to end up being the hero of the story to try and help, like, get back a local priest that's been kidnapped, was my example. And um, it can be that they have got some uses as being the child of an orc and an ogre. Back to Kuatoa for number 55. And um, this was all about their religion, actually, this one. So it's all about how they can create their gods from sheer will, which is a bit of an interesting one. And how they are able to then um, be so malicious and so slighted that they want to deal with this by creating a deity that's going to help them. It also, this story looks into the idea that in the past, maybe, it wasn't like this. Maybe Kuatoa used to be really, really pleasant people. Maybe they were the surface dwellers until they were forced underwater by the expanding tide of humans, elves and dwarves. Next, we had um, 156 is quite an interesting one, actually, about having a space adventure in a medieval fantasy version. So the idea being is that there was a paladin that fell from grace and became a death knight. And a whole load of very powerful sorcerers sent this um, death knight, trapped it inside a metal prison and sent this as high up in the sky as they possibly could. Now... The party have now been teleported there by some other evil sorcerer, maybe one who was involved in the original entrapment, but has turned evil. So they send the party up there to try and kill them from this death knight. But what they end up doing, and they have to do in order to survive, is to take up the death knight and then find a way to end the enchantment and have this metal prison fall from the sky. Moving on to the next one, which is 157, which is all about Duragar. Now, these guys are mainly based in the Underdark, but they are master crafters. And therefore, it could be really, really cool to have the players arrive in the Underdark in one of their massive um, cities that they have done with huge architectural feats and all of that sort of stuff, and then have them work out what happened, because it's going to be abandoned. So I had an idea that maybe it was a plague or a famine. Maybe there's an election that went wrong. Maybe there was a super intelligent construct that now runs the city, which is now got full of nothing. Number 158 was me looking at um, Moonstone Dragons, which were, involved, which were introduced in Fizzbangs. So this is comparing them to Chromatic and Metallic and Gemstone Dragons, whereas Moonstone Dragons are from the Feywild. Now, this is an idea that they, instead of hoarding material riches, they love sentimental riches. And so therefore it's a very good plot hook at the start of a campaign to have them steal things that mean a lot to every member of your party and have them be like this, maybe not a full-on BBEG, but have, be them, have them be an annoyance, an antagonist that the players have to be like, okay, I need that back, really. Number 159 was about animated trees, and it's all about a prophecy that goes against a evil king, which he has been told that whenever the trees march on the city, the dynasty will end. Now, whether or not the tyrant uh, heeds the warning or isn't, and which side your parties are on, that is up to you. And it's kind of this idea that maybe 
the party are involved in bringing these things to life in order to fight back. Next one was 160, Bone Nagas. Now, this is all about them and their relationship with Yuanti. So, Yuanti um, have learnt to turn these things into their own, like, slaves almost, because they kill Nagas and then reanimate them before they can be reincarnated as they normally would be. And therefore, if your players come across one of these things, they have to deal with it. But it would be interesting to have your party... Um, have to understand what caused it and maybe break the cycle and allow this bone naga to then reincarnate as a flesh naga again. Up next we had Afriti. Now, these guys are known for looking like devils, but they are actually fire elementals. They are genies, and therefore maybe you could have a big misunderstanding that the, the townsfolk of a town are absolutely hating this Afriti who appears to be coming in and causing fires and they all call it a devil but that only makes it worse because it doesn't like being called a devil and therefore it gets angry and does the same thing. It's a perpetuating cycle that maybe your party can deal with. Maybe they just end the Afriti, maybe they reason with it and understand that maybe if the townsfolk were nicer to it they wouldn't have these many problems. Up next we have Lemurays. Now 162 was all about how we how you could be extra evil to your players and um, make it so that every NPC in the world is being turned into one of these things by the BBEG and the party have to therefore act even quicker to deal with the bad. It, this is useful if your players are delaying finishing the campaign. It can be fun to give them a bit of an impetus to be like, if you don't do it soon, some things will go wrong. Time, time sensitivity is always a good thing in a campaign. Next up was the Helmed Horror. Now, this was talking about the fact that these enemies are known for being particularly good statisticians and good combat technicians. And therefore, it's making you think a bit more that actually some of your enemies are going to be smart. Some of these enemies are going to be able to think and strategize and do some really good things to actually, like, win the fight. Therefore, you shouldn't always have enemies that are just running at your players and swiping. You should have... Uh, enemies that are shooting at the back lines to try and get rid of your mages and your archers as opposed to just taking out the tank constantly. Up next, 164, was um, Belashira. Now, this is an evil... I call it the evil Santa of D&D. It's a Lord of Eyes. Now, it can tell if you've been bad or good, give you horrible visions that drive you into violence and madness. And it's just a generally terrifying thing to go up against. It steals your sight, can look through your eyes, and then can attack things using that sight. And I would say um, maybe a good way of introducing this to a campaign would be to say an NPC has had horrible visions. And then the players are going to have to deal with this aberration and then go and fight it. 165 was all about lava. Now these things are creepy. They are like six foot long slugs with deformed humans' faces. They used to be humans, but that was a long time ago. So maybe having your party arrive at a ruin and have these things inhabit it and stopping them from escaping, that could be quite fun. 166 was all about whether or not you could make a dragon into a pet in D&D. Now, this is something that has been talked about before. But you've got to remember that dragons are inherently very smart. And therefore, it's more likely to be the other way around and that your party end up being a pet. Maybe that is something that happens, that they spend time trying to train up a dragon, but eventually it goes wrong, and this dragon now sees them as its property. 167 was about Slardy. Now, these guys are, I believe, demons or devils. I did do a video on those at some point, but um, these things can actually attack and convert you into other Slardy by implanting eggs into you. They're really kind of scary. And therefore I thought, why not have it so that they've infected the king? And now you have to go to the uh, homeland of the Slard, which, are lim which is Limbo, and you need to find a cure for this before the pandemic spreads. Next one, which was 168, is an adult Kruthic. Now these things are chittering. This is reptilian insect birds. Now this is a particularly scary thing and they're normally seen under mountains and stuff like that so i thought maybe it would be a good idea to have a mountain that your party want to investigate or to siege to get treasures out of but by going into it they release a swarm of these things that are going to attack the local town or the, the village that lives on this mountain back to dragons again for 169 and now this is talking about dragon puberty so obviously 
puberty is a bad time for any kind of species but for dragons when they learn how to breathe fire when they get squeaky voices and are a bit more prone to mood swings maybe this is a problem time to have it attack the town now the next 170 now this is something that is a bit of a slow burn in the campaign it's the idea of having a flying sword so this is a king giving the party a flying sword near the start of the campaign and it helps them throughout the most of the fights. It actually is an ally who runs around. Eventually the players come to a massive tomb of a very famous warrior. And as they go to the to the, to the massive crypt and recover this um, man, the ex-corpse now sits up and is now expecting thanks because it's actually been that his spirit has been holding the sword the entire time. And when the party are not thankful for his help or maybe confused or something it flies into a rage and starts to attack them maybe they need to subdue it and then reason with it once it's been subdued 171 now this introduces time travel and dryads it's the idea that the future of the the, the world has been that they have chopped down all the trees and it's become hugely industrialized but the entire plane is dying and so this dryad has come back in time to warn the players that they need to stop it now it's up to you whether or not your players heed the warning or whether or not they know what to do or whether it becomes apparent later on, but it's a nice idea. Now, number 172 is back to genies and how you make good wishes. So I think that it's often important to make sure that while you do have positive, like, while the wishes are normally positive and there is a negative attached to them, often in kind of genie stories, it can be good to think about why they're doing that. So why are they purposefully adding negative situations to these wishes? And maybe it's because that is how they feed. Maybe it's because there's something above them that needs this kind of chaos in the world. But I thought it'd be interesting to have a think about that if you are introduced introduce a genie to the world. Give them some kind of impetus for to be doing being a dick rather than just letting them be a dick. Now, 173. I talked about having a dragon as a pet. But 173 is all about having a demon as a pet. Now, the idea that they, um, the party get given a gem that prevents a slain demon from returning to the abyss, this will create a shadow demon. And if the party are very adept at dealing with demons, maybe they could turn this thing into the party's mascot. I thought it was an idea that would be fun if you had a magic item that did it, especially given that it shows that maybe the party aren't necessarily the best people in the world if they have this thing captive. <sighs> up next we go back to the idea that some hill giants are not quite like every other hill giant and so we have Glorpo. Glorpo is 174 and he lives in his mother's basement and has never destroyed a village but that's mainly because he's lazy. Their party will find him at the side of the road after his mum kicked him out and the idea being is that he asks them to help him convince his mother that he is scary and has done some evil things so that he can be accepted back into society. Whether or not that after that they actually attack him and all of this stuff, it's maybe once he's back with these people, they now try and attack the party, and it's all all of these intrinsicities that you could add to your campaign. Now, 175 is about Strahd zombies. Unlike husk zombies, these don't convert the things that they attack, but Strahd zombies have a fun feature that if you chop off a piece of their body, that piece of body will still keep fighting and i thought maybe you could add this to other sorts of undead such as dracoliches where you chop off a dracolich's head and it still breathes fire at you so i thought there was a lot of fun to be doing with that number 176 was all about azer elemental creatures and evil uh, genies uh, but these are the opposite of that which because most elemental creatures are these genies the opposite of that is an azer these are master crafters of the plane of fire so I thought maybe you could bring together these Duragar and just Primaterial Dwarves who are good crafters and maybe have some kind of competition or have them have to work together and see what kind of fun hijinks you can have with that. Up next with 177, we talked about sprites. Now these can read creatures' emotions, alignments and stuff like that. This can be very fun if you couple it with modify memory. So you have the party travelling in a huge group and it turns out that actually someone has modified the memory of this sprite because it has realized that you are traveling with an evil creature. Moving on to 178, where you've got the Drow Elite Warrior. This is an idea that the party later on in the campaign have maybe um, angered a lot of people. Not necessarily good people they've angered, but there will be people they've angered. 
And so maybe there's a huge bounty on their heads, and this drow elite warrior is now an assassin who is ready to take them out. I thought it would be quite fun to have that idea that now they are becoming hunted, especially if they've become very, very powerful. Maybe a group of these have now attacked them, I don't know. 179, only 21 to go now, is a frost worm. This is kind of joined with 180 actually, so I'll do them together. So a frost worm gave me the idea of a frozen tundra again, where the party are trying to get to somewhere necessarily in this arctic environment, but they are being attacked by this ice worm. Now, the other side of this, it would be a yeti who knows the tundra quite well, but instead of being a wanting to attack them, it's very, very confused as to why these adventurers are sitting right in the middle of the frost worm's eating grounds. And so tries to go and help them, but then the worm attacks and there's this huge fight, and the party have to decide which side they want to land on. So now we move on to 181, which is all about gloom stalkers, which are swirling worm-shaped clouds of darkness. Now, these were normally a myth from the lands of Wildmount, and so nobody thought that they existed. So therefore, it becomes a situation where your party have to find an equally mythic weapon to try and take it out once it appears and starts attacking all the cities of the land. As always, it's nice to have a Tarask story in one of these, so I've gone for 182 being a Tarask story. This actually came from a commenter, so as I've said, if you want to put your own comments in here, please do drop them in the comments and I will use them. This one came from a Manoob, um, and the idea was that this Tarask, well I suppose it's no longer a Tarask, but it is now huge. It's the size of a continent and is swallowing entire land masses. And now the party have to try and fight their way through the insides of this huge Tarask. To try, and, um, to try and take it out and save the world. And it's whether or not the party are able to do this early and therefore save things from being eaten, or whether they're going to have to wait for new things to be eaten so they can actually go in and grab what they need from those new areas. Number 183 was about shadows. And I thought this gave me the idea for a competitive heist mission. So why not have it so that your party up against another group of adventurers who need to steal something from an evil lord's vault or a castle or something like that, but have the enemy be a group of shadows, which makes it very easy for them to get in, or at least maybe have one of them be a shadow, and then have this kind of competitive heist that you have to get there first, and there's some kind of big reward if you do. Maybe this is good for more of a neutral campaign rather than a particularly good campaign, because you are stealing. Up next, we talked about Dryders for 184. Now, this is all about angering Lolf and being turned into a massive demon spider if you're a drow. Maybe, again, you could have a, a, a bad from the uh, start of the campaign be a drow who then gets imprisoned but then gets turned into this huge spider that then manages to break out and the party have to deal with them when they are much, much more powerful. Up next, we had Bone Knights. Now, these guys made me think that you could have an entirely organised army of undead to fight against because these guys can control um, undead legions very very easily which is unlike most other things so therefore i thought maybe you could have a huge big bad necromancer at the top have some of these guys maybe three or four of these bone knights and then have the hordes underneath them to try and organize and make it a bit more like it's a structure take out one of these guys and suddenly the entire hordes just are rambling around with no kind of aim up next 184 was all about dinosaurs and how they don't need to be extinct in your world. Normally you just think about it, oh, they're not real, are they? But in reality, because it's not Earth, they don't need to be extinct, and therefore you should bring in things like Allosaurus's, T-Rexes, and all of that sort of stuff. I'll get back to this in a bit later. There is another plot hook, I believe, in this video. If not, I'll add it at the end as an extra one. But yeah, for now, just add dinosaurs to your world. It's always a bit of fun. 187 was about Bahirs. Now... This is an idea that these guys hide inside caverns, and maybe you could have a plot hook for your players where they have to go and get into this cavern to find out what's been going wrong or why people have been disappearing, and all they find is loads of skeletons. And instead, what's happened is they've entered in and been ambushed by this thing that can disappear very easily and is now appearing at the entrance ready to attack them. Up next, 188. I just went for some ideas about fantasy racism. It's always fun to have this idea of the big bad being the um, being uh, an orc who has been wrongly pushed out of the line of succession, maybe, was the one I went for. But it is a very good idea to have early in your campaign so you can understand the opinions of the NPCs in your world. 
and understand that maybe there are some movements to help be nicer to orcs or maybe everyone just re really thinks that they're awful and it's up to your party which side they land on and all of this sort of stuff we then also looked at drow for 189 which was the idea that these guys were banished to the underdark and um it's all about how the entire idea of your next campaign could be these guys coming back and then you have to deal with like insurgent groups or little pockets of these guys scouting the the surface world and right at the end you have this big whole fight with the surface dwellers versus the drow and it's just like a very very big fight you could also send your party to the underdark to have them take out legions or while this war's going on they have to take out the commander of the drow to end the war or something so we are now into the final, well, 11, I think, technically, and we're back to dragons. This is talking about what if you had dragons that were being kept in a zoo? This goes back to the idea of, like, them being very, very intelligent. So what if you had a powerful sorcerer feeble-minding them, and eventually one day they break out? Even the good dragons at this point will have had enough of the little creatures that seem to be manipulating them, and they will fight back. Then you have a problem, and your party have to try and deal with that situation. Up next, we have Zorbos for 91, 191, which is um, literally a very cute thing that is quite vicious if they go rabid. I just thought it's an idea to always have something cute that your players are immediately attached to that then goes wild and attacks you back. Number 92, 192 was Chimeras. Now, these are things with one head as a dragon, one head as a lion, one head as a goat, and they were created by Demi Demogorgon, who was displeased by what they saw when they came to the surface. Most of these things are no longer there, but maybe your party will have to track down one of the few remaining chimeras to try and get the milk, as it's a very useful thing in a cure, because it's never just normal milk or normal honey, is it? You need it from some kind of evil, demonic creature. Up next, we are going to talk about Tyrannosaurus rexes, and most likely for 193, Jurassic Park. The idea that, like the zoo for dragons I mentioned earlier, Having a zoo for dinosaurs is such a good idea, isn't it? That's not going to go wrong. Uh, you can already... I'm hoping this has already given you some inspiration and you can use these ideas. But by all means, yeah, have fun. Up next is the idea for an evil campaign. Now, these are fun. I do like this idea as most evil campaigns end up with your players just being a dick. And I'm not really sure I enjoy those campaigns that much. This idea, however, is make them the bad guys, like make them actual devil, de uh, devils, and they have to work their way up the hierarchy. So their level one version, instead of being like a level one evil man, they are a manes and need to take out things with their really weak abilities until they then go up a level and up a level and up a level. And their main actual target at the end of all this isn't to like kill anyone on the prime material, but it's to take on the devil that is in charge of their area and then see themselves at this situation where, sorry, this situation where they eventually take it out and take control of one of the layers of the abyss. Sorry, I got that wrong. They're, de they're demons, not devils, but the same idea that they have to work their way up. You could do it with devils as well. Talking about demons, actually, we are, the number 195 was all about rocks. Now, this is the thing that's been able to escape from the abyss and is now feasting on townsfolk each night. The idea of this was pretty much just the game Werewolf. I thought it'd be very fun to be able to do this with a cast of NPC characters so you can play a multitude of characters who the party then have to try and suss out who it is going to be. Maybe there's a curse where every day is only lasting like five minutes and then it, it, wrap, it speeds up the process and everyone has to try and work out who is the rock before they go to bed. 196 down to the final five. This one is a Corsborn Seer. Now these are, Corsborn were like servants of ancient Eldritch Horrors. And therefore, there's not that many of them left. But if you do have a small civilization of them, they are genuinely chaotically evil. And their religion is also chaotically evil. Therefore, I thought it'd be interesting to have uh, the other side of it where you have a fully fledged religion, like your clerics will have for a lot of their stuff, but make it so it's completely insane. Like everything about it is just like, what the hell are you talking about? I thought that would be quite fun. 197 was all about hydras and the idea that it doesn't just have to be this kind of dragon ice type thing that has can be a hydra. You should make any kind of creature a hydra where you chop off a head and it grows two more. Imagine what you can do with that. I mean, I asked in that video to give you me ideas of what you would want in the comments below, but I always like this idea as to what would you do if you chopped off someone's head and they grew two. 
like the BBEG not being that easily decapitated would be very, very fun, especially if they're taken for execution and become this powerful deity. That would be quite fun. Number 98 was all about this elderly bugbear, Monsieur Herbert, who I cut. I love the name I came up with, but um, the idea is he invites everyone to the mansion on the hill and eventually locks the door and tells them that there can only be one survivor and your party have to just fight their way out of this castle and see why Herbert has done this and maybe what makes him powerful enough to not get caught in it himself. Maybe this is a rehash of a Family Guy episode I was watching, but you know what? It's still an idea. And next were the final two. 199 was all about how you could set your D&D campaigns in the modern day. Like, most of the time they're set in medieval fantasy, but maybe there's a world where the BBEG of the world is Elon Musk or some kind of big CEO of some kind of company, and the players meet at a Starbucks or a regular bar instead of a tavern. It's just an idea for a kind of a new, interesting different take on a D&D campaign. And finally, number 200 was about murder mysteries and giving you the main ingredients you needed to do a murder mystery in your world, which is just to have a closed box world, well not a world, a closed box scenario with limited characters and just have one of them die in suspicious circumstances. Suddenly you have to just give every character a motive and just point a trail of clues at one character and have it immediately switch to another character, another character, another character, and your party will be sent on a wild goose chase trying to work out who it is. These plot hooks are, the, the, these murder mystery kind of arcs are always my favourites to run. And they are very, very satisfying at the end. So there we have it. That is a hundred plot hooks. And I have just sat here and rambled at you for literally 56 minutes. So I hope you have enjoyed this episode. And if you have, please do like and subscribe. And I will see you next time when you have obviously subscribed and are obviously going to love all my videos but no, seriously you don't feel you have to i hope you have a good day and ta-ra <laughs>